Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This is episode 235. Yeah, we talk with Ian McDonald. We've had him on before. Yeah, and what he just finished uh, wrapping up a 15-part series on the history of vegetarian veganism. And it's pretty fucking amazing and in-depth. You really need to check it out. I really love the timeline. It just like shows the overall history, and then you can click on each area of the timeline and view the podcast for that. Yeah, who cool. We'll have the link in, in the show notes for it. Make sure to check them out. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. We love having them on. So sit back and enjoy. We are at war! The Soul Cast is a twice a month anarchist podcast hosted by North American rap artist Soul. It's a podcast about revolutionary politics from an anarchist perspective. Every month, I interview academics, journalists, revolutionaries, quote-unquote activists, artists, musicians, and really anything that I find interesting. I never got to go to college, so this, is, I guess, is my cheat sheet. So anybody who wants to learn, you can learn with me. Subscribe in iTunes at tinyurl.com forward slash soulcast. And check it out on the Channel Zero Podcast Network. We are at war! Thank you so much for being on again. It's been quite a while since since you were on. Um, that was what, almost two years ago. It was more than two years, I think. Yeah, it, um, it was during the Kickstarter campaign, which ran um, early in 2014. Wow, time. Um, so it's, and thank you for your help. Uh, thank you for having me on then. Uh, and since then, um, we gathered the funding. I have been a- across and up and down India talking to people. I have uh, talked to dozens of experts and, uh, and people who've lived the various changes. And I am almost finished the series. So, so what has really taken in place since that that first interview? Since it's been so much time, is there more going on besides just the, the vegan option? Uh, I fundraised for a ten by fifteen minute part radio history of vegetarianism, but with my usual failure of restraint, it's now a fifteen by half hour plus radio history of vegetarianism, <laughs> uh, often with multiple visits to interesting places where the story unfolded in every show, um, actors, uh, ridiculous amounts of research to uh, check out this claim and that claim. Um, so it's really, um, so what I've produced is, I think, uh, an epic in in the good sense of the word of, of really telling our full backstory starting at the Bronze Age and uh, with a foray through prehistory and ritual and following the threads right up to the present day. What's been one of the most surprising things that you've learned through all this research and time? How contemporary uh, some of the conversations sound. Uh, I mean, when you hear... um, uh, when you hear one of the Neoplatonists of the third century uh, having to write that uh, to compare eating animals to eating plants uh, and say, but do you think it's okay to eat plants? Therefore, you think it, uh, the, uh, the, the claiming plants has feelings, quote, does violence to the order of things. It, I'm just, it's just mind blowing that this guy in in the late Roman Empire, who was vegetarian, was having to deal with people going, plants, though. <laughs> <laughs> and it, not just that there were people being vegetarian, but, but, but the other side were making the same stupid comments. That, that almost doesn't bode well for the future, then, does it? <laughs> 
Well, there are... Um, I think the massive progress is in the things that make it more practical to live a vegetarian life and a vegan life. And I think that, uh, I, I, I think throughout all of history, you do say the practical option uh, makes an awful lot of difference. Uh, and I don't know whether you, you see the same ideas in India and in, in ancient India and in ancient Greece, but they take hold in India in a way they don't in Greece. And there's a fairly high chance that it's just easier to um, it's just easier to to um, to grow enough plant in, enough plants in India and, and and the Mediterranean coast is after all a coastline and on a coastline people are going to eat fish mm -hmm. usually I mean the Greeks get a bit weird and snobbish about it but the Romans don't it's I mean the whole of uh, one of the more bizarre things about um, I, I, I interviewed somebody who uh, who wrote and researched food taboos in the ancient world, Michael Beer. And he commented that in the whole of Homer's uh, Odyssey, um, with this boat traipsing around the eastern Mediterranean, having adventures, uh, and occasionally being waylaid by vegans, it's, uh, they, don't they don't eat any fish. Fish is never mentioned even though they, they obviously could get some. So obviously they have a weird taboo, and that was beside the point. But the opportunity makes a lot of difference. We have the Chinese mock meats coming through um, somewhere in the Middle Ages, and that must have made a massive contribution to the tenacity of levels of vegetarianism in China. Well, I mean, China nowadays in practice has more vegans than the United States. How, how much of that in, entrenchment has to do with the individual uh, religions of the regions embracing vegetarian or veganism compared to like the Mediterranean where it wasn't really embraced by the religions? Um, I think, well, that's the great part of the battle. I mean, vegetarianism usually is part of veganism are usually there as part of broader belief systems. Mm -hmm. um, we, we tend to, I mean, we you tend to unite as vegans on the, the basic ethical ground that animals don't deserve to be hurt. Um, but uh, when people have more complex belief systems throughout history, um, I mean, one of the belief systems that that was a close challenger for Christianity's dominance over the Mediterranean basin was Manichaeanism. And their, um, their priesthood, for want of a better word, um, kept to a vegan diet because they believed that, um, that if they kept an entirely pure nonviolent lifestyle, they would be able to slowly, particle by particle, liberate uh, from this torture creation. Um, so that there is an idea, uh, there was an idea of veganism in there, in the late Roman Empire, that just, even though it was for, for, an, idea, for an, an idea you and I wouldn't relate to, the Manichaeans had this uh, ornate belief system about how, uh, how the world came out of a battle between good and evil and bits of soul got splintered away from that and they get saved by being swallowed by a pure elect and then sung out in a hymn. So a really weird to us belief system, but ends up with a vegan diet. And it just, it was just, they just lost against Christianity. And the fact that Christianity's rival was this, was this pro, was this belief system in which not everybody was vegan, but uh, but the very, but the elect, the top, were meant to be, um, meant that Christianity in its early centuries was very down on vegetarianism. 
was what took vegetarianism as a sign of heresy. Um, you you have accounts of of Cathars um, in medieval France being ki- be, being uh, killed because, and the thing that made that that threw suspicion on them was that they refused to kill a chicken. All of our history, of as far as like veganism, is really rooted in that religious realm. But when I look at veganism now, it's almost the exact opposite. Not that it doesn't exist, but you feel that there's a lot more people, at least in the United States, that are vegan, not because of religious reasons. Well, that largely reflects the fact that we live in a more secular age. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the belief systems that you had in uh, in the ancient world. Uh, I mean, yes, they are asking basic questions of reality. Um, uh, is there predestination? Is there free will? What are we made of? What does it mean to be human? Um, but they are just guessing about the nature of the universe, the nature of matter, the nature of what makes living things live. They're just guessing about what makes living things live. And, and nowadays, we have a much more confident idea. So... In a way, there is less diversity of opinion about uh, about what the animating principle uh, of uh, of humans and animals is. We think it's biochemistry. Uh, what the difference is in awareness between uh, b- between between humans, animals, and plants. We we think it's uh, we think it's down to the cognition that's produced by. Um, by the brains, uh, so it's it's not a shock that that actually the arguments nowadays are in, are in the realm of ethics mostly, um, but not entirely. Uh, a fair number, if you if you look at the the number of restaurants, the number of people who are take the time to set up restaurants, and quite a lot of them. Quite a lot of the big chains belong to pro-vegetarian religions. The Country Life from the Seventh Day Adventists, um, the the Qinghai Supreme Master Movement has Loving Hut. Mm-hmm. Um, there is um, there's a, yep um, the and, and the Hebrew Christians of Jerusalem, the, the, Afro, the African American religious group that that see themselves as a lost tribe of Israel and in some cases have even moved to to Israel. So we we have the there's and and the new spiritual but not religious folk um that that's kind of is is its own religious tradition that kind of owes which which we find it hard to describe nowadays, but actually has a lot more in common with the naturally polytheistic traditions of of the ancient world or modern India than than the monolithic religious traditions of Islam, Christianity, Judaism that we are so used to that we we've we've got used to thinking of as the norm. So I think we've just entered a different. Um, a, a different realm of, of 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 the way people think about the uh, of the way people think about how the universe is structured, and the fact that most vegans are of the straightforward ethical we shouldn't hurt animals bent owes quite a lot um, to to the fact that we that we're in a secular age. Um, but, but obviously, it's a basic principle, a golden rule that can be expressed lots of different ways. And the guy who set up the American Vegan Society, I've just been uh, editing a little snippet of his one of his talks for the last episode. Um, he was hev- uh, he would sit on the Jane Vegetarian Board. He was um, his. He was half Indian by descent. He was brought up vegetarian, and he definitely and and he used the the ancient Indian word ahimsa, meaning harmlessness, an awful lot. And that was simply, however much, um, 
and however much that principle is couched in a religious or a secular framework, it's still the same principle. So we've talked about secularism and no gods. Now let's talk about no masters and anarchy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because um, I mean the first the first organized vegan movement was anarchist. Um, it was the uh, it was the uh, the vegetarian. Le vegetarian were early twentieth century anarchists who decided that to be completely independent of masters, uh, you needed to reduce all the things you were using so that your body wasn't polluted and you you didn't need as much stuff. Uh, and the word vegetarian already existed in in French. It's um, it roughly speaking means vegetable Aryan, uh, but they they took it to mean no tea, no coffee, no chocolate, uh, a very frugal diet, quite so with erring towards raw, uh, and as part of a communal anarchist philosophy. I mean, there was uh, there was even a. Are a drive-by armed robbery gang uh, in the early 20th century France. One of the first armed gangs to use getaway cars was actually vegetarian and anarchist and raising money, I think, for their anarchist political projects by robbing banks. Um, I'm all on but, board, <laughs> except the chocolate and tea. <laughs> yeah, I, I think... Um, and alcohol. Uh so, <laughs> so they were straight edge. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're quite. They're basically yes. Uh, these are ana, these are anarchist straight edge vegans uh, in early twentieth century France. My um, thoughts. And they um, and they set up communes and they had a chain of uh, of restaurants and their own salad called La Basquenaise. Um, that they thought would be a complete meal, um, and they had a, uh, and they had a, a, a couple of other interesting uh, dietary uh, beliefs, but um, but they petered out with their founders. But it was uh, a really interesting little movement that, at its time, uh, managed to to keep outposts going in, all around France. But if you asked anybody in the early 20th century who the most famous vegetarian was, um, they'd say Count Leo Tolstoy, who who had a dramatic conversion to vegetarianism after visiting a slaughterhouse uh, and settled his own. But his motivation was deeply religious. Mm -hmm. He... Um, he had a massive crisis of faith uh, and came out of it um, deeply touched by the Gospels, by the Christian Gospels, but very much an anarchist version of them in which Jesus was simply a fantastic teacher. And it's, it seems he came to a very stripped down liberal theology with a very radical message about giving up your wealth and sharing it and working in communes and asceticism and kind of fell out with his wife quite badly over it, but particularly the giving away all his wealth. <laughs> uh, but there were, um, there were Tolstoyan communities uh, all around the world. Um, Gandhi called his ashram in in South Africa, Tolstoy Farm. He he owed a lot of his views to Tolstoy. And actually, um, I think um, there was a Tolstoyan congregation in Croydon, in South London, that set up a vegetarian society. And that vegetarian society was still around in 1944. And one of the pivotal events that played a pivotal role in the launch of a launch of a of a a proper vegan movement that wasn't attached to any other philosophies was was kind of a meeting ground for vegans from of all persuasions and uh, because that society was still around 50 years later and hosted a debate 
uh, between the vegans and the non-vegans, and that was probably the first time that the the yet to be called the vegans who are yet to be called vegans actually came together and actually met each other uh, because that was quite a, a well attended and written up uh, debate. And there were people who were there who then a few months later went up to set up the vegan society. So without anarchism, we uh, without anarchism, um, who knows if we'd have had um, a vegan society in 1944. That is crazy. I didn't know that part of it. Um, I only recently, like in the last couple of years, have learned a lot more about Tolstoy and his role. Um, and, it, and it's crazy to me uh, that in a lot of the anarchist literature, he kind of gets passed over because he was so religious that he was kind of ostracized a little bit from the mainstream anarchist movements at the time. Because whereas his religiousness actually was very, in its way, no gods, no monsters. Mm-hmm. Even though he was, uh, and I, I feel as, there's no way I can explain that sentence <laughs> uh, to listeners, but he just had a very stripped away. Uh, he didn't think that Jesus was the son of God or anything. He, um, I'm not, I don't think he believed in life after death. He, he was, a, it was a very liberal version of Christianity. Yeah, like almost so liberal that it's not really Christianity, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. What do you think has been the cause of the ongoing contention with vegetarian and vegans throughout history? Because it always seems like there's always a, a major problem with it uh, from another power. I'm I'm not sure that's always true. Obviously, there's a tendency for people not to be like anybody saying, I think this thing you're doing is wrong. Um, even if they're saying, I, 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 and then... I personally don't do it, and I'll say no more about it. Um, that intrinsically will tend to rub folk the wrong way. And I've got a whole, however nice you are about it, and I, I actually did a, uh, a an episode about that with a psychologist, um, which is in my back archive at the Vegan Option Talk. Uh, but I read a really interesting paper in research uh, about South India uh, in the Middle Ages and the arguments people had between the different religions there, all, all of which we'd now basically call Hinduism, well, if we're simplifying, but there really are different religions under that umbrella. And they're, and some of them are vegetarian and some of them aren't, and they're trying to find things to accuse each other of, uh, but they don't, uh, they don't focus on the vegetarianism, or at least um, the... Uh, or at least the vegetarians focus on it because it's their strong suit. And uh, but the non-vegetarian, the non-vegetarian religions don't actually don't try and tackle on that because don't try and argue with vegetarianism. Don't try and make out that it's a bad thing, presumably because um, the argument has been won and that actually people are giving uh, the Jains and the Vishnu worshippers uh, respect for being vegetarian, uh, and it, it's very hard to turn it into a bad thing. We see it turned into a bad thing in other contexts. Uh, certainly there is a, a Jesuit preaching Christianity to, to the Chinese in, uh, in, I think, the 17th century, uh, who... Who, who takes up all the arguments we used to. He says that it's doing the animals a favor because they'd disappear if they weren't farmed, that kind of thing. Um, he criticizes the Chinese practice of, of having particular days of the week where they don't eat animals and says that basically that's like having a, a murder-free Monday. Um, so he's... It, but he's going against vegetarianism because he thinks it's a wedge issue. He thinks he's in a culture where some people are pro-vegetarian, some people are anti-vegetarian. He's decided that he can, that Christianity is ha, has a much better chance if he puts it forward as a strand of Confucianism. If he um, if if he attaches it to the people who are already against vegetarianism, so he's playing a game. I really don't think that there's an inherent principle. I think we've just been a bit unlucky 
that um, we, we're, we've just been a bit unlucky that, that Christianity won the West and that was slightly intrinsically less well favoured towards other animals. But, I mean, we are basically arguing for something altruistic. We are arguing for people to... Um, to, to to not take full advantage of of uh, of being able to manage the rest of the planet. Um, <laughs> so I mean, it's always that's that kind of progress um, is always uphill. But um, um, the arc of justice is long, but it curves upwards. Well. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. How are some ways that people can find your projects and keep in touch? Well, uh, my uh, this series, The Vegetarianism and the Story So Far, is essentially a season of my podcast, The Vegan Option, uh, which is available at all good podcast providers, uh, iTunes, Library, and what have you. Uh, if you search for The Vegan Option, uh, also, of course, theveganoption.org and Vegan Option on Facebook, Twitter, um, and SoundCloud. Witchside Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Witchside Media Collective, with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. <laughs>